made it super frustrating for my family. Yeah. Can you imagine just like watching your daughter or your sister just like actively yeah. try to starve yourself, basically? Welcome to the Hail Fitness yes, Podcast. I am Coach Jay. I am here with Coach Rebecca and Coach Katie. And we are holding a vigil for Coach Wendy, who is on vacation. Do we even know where she went? She's in San Luis Obispo, which oh, is where okay. I guessed. Well, Heidi actually did the geography. Shoot, we forgot to put her picture up here. It's okay. Oh, right. We got to put oh, her picture up there. here. Just here. Just, just we'll pop that one over there. Just like this. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. There Wendy's, we go. Wendy's, There's Wendy. Wendy's there. Yeah. Wendy, what do you think? She's, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, if you're listening to this, this doesn't mean anything. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, I thought we'd take this opportunity to uh, to kind of get to know Katie a little bit. Mm. And um, I know we've done kind of an intro podcast with Coach Katie, but Coach Katie has a lot of stories and... One of the things that we've talked about quite a bit kind of off off the air was eating disorders. Right. And so I thought it might be useful to kind of dig into your story, kind of what's what happened with you and, yeah. you know, see if we can share that with uh, with other folks sure. who maybe have similar histories or are going through this now. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to start with the the time you were in the emergency room. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? So it was January. This is January of 2000. Shoot, I don't even remember anymore. Would have been four, something okay. like that. Mm. So we're talking like 20 years ago. Yeah. Okay, so I was a uh, freshman in high school, mm. and it was the winter time. Mm. So what happened was um, I was dangerously thin, and we can get into how that happened, um, but... Uh, would always wear my winter coats around the house because it was always so cold. Mm. And what happened was because I was always covered in layers, you know, like it was really easy to kind of slide by and no one really noticed how thin I was. And we went to visit my extended family over Christmas break that year. And then a lot of people commented and made comments to my parents enough to kind of like pique their attention. Like maybe we should get this checked out. Yeah. And so we went to the doctor. My mom, unbeknownst to me, made an appointment with the doctor. Mm -hmm. And so we went in to see the doctor, and I thought it was just a regular old doctor's appointment. And uh, the doctor puts me on the scale. I'm 72 pounds, wow. takes my temperature, and it doesn't even register on the thermometer. Wow. When they finally get it to read, it's like ni you're 93 degrees. Like, I didn't even know body temperature could go that low. Holy crap. Jesus. So it was dangerous enough that they were basically like, you're going to the hospital. <laughs> Like today, like right now. So we went home, packed a bunch of bags, and then off we went. And that was the beginning of a very interesting adventure. How long were you in the hospital? About a month. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's about <laughs> right. three weeks. What were, they, what were they doing? Well, so the very first thing they do is they just get your body temperature up and they get fluids in you. Right. So that was what happened first. And they actually, it was, um, what they fear is like your heart will fail yeah. because your heart's a muscle and it was so low, like my heartbeat was so low and I would get dizzy every time I would stand up, all this stuff. And so uh, they covered me in these weighted blankets, which was amazing because it was the first time I'd been warm in so long. And then, um, and they made me stay in bed. So for at least the first week, it was like, I couldn't even get up to use the bathroom. Like they literally brought a bedpan in. Wow. Uh, yeah. So I was peeing into that. <laughs> Wow. And uh, yeah, and, and then they feed you. So it's kind of an interesting, they immediately started me working with a dietitian. And so I would see a pediatrician because I was young at the time. So I'd see a pediatrician. She would come in. Um, then I also saw during the time that I was in the hospital, a dietitian. And the dietitian would come in and we would look at the hospital menu together and we would put together what are my meals going to be. And then I worked with a therapist. So a therapist would come in on the regular too. Yeah. And that's yeah. sort of like how it went. Right. So, and you're in there for a month. Mm -hmm. And I guess we can kind of take a step back. Like, right. what, what led to this? Yeah. Like, it's a great question. And to be honest with you, there was a long time where everyone asked that question and I didn't have an answer. Mm. Like, to me, 
I was working with this therapist and she was really trying to kind of get at the root of what was, what went wrong? Like what happened here? Right. And I could never really pinpoint anything. I'm like, I love my family. Like I've got a great family life. Um, like I'm a happy person, but like this thing just happened. I couldn't really explain it. When I look back on it now, I think there were a couple of things that were going on. Like the main thing being I had been a gymnast for nine years up until my freshman year of high school. And then I decided to quit. Like I had kind of had enough and I wanted to have more of a social life. Um, was that when you had the injury? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Also got injured a couple times in like the span of two years. And it was just like, there were a lot of things that uh-huh. were kind of pushing me out of it. And, um, anyway, so I made that choice and then, um, you know, I was sort of battling with this identity crisis, mm-hmm. right? Of like, that was who I thought I was and that's what everybody knew me as. And there was this element of feeling like I made this choice, so I should feel really good about the fact that I'm not doing gymnastics anymore. And now I have all this free time, right? Yeah. And, um, and truly, like, I was really grieving, like... I lost the whole friend group who had become family because that's you're spending five hours with these girls every day. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I kind of lost that, like lost this sense of who I was, and I didn't really know how to process it, and I just felt guilty about feeling so sad about it mm. when it was the thing that I chose. Yeah. So I think there was a lot going on that was like, these are feelings that are really uncomfortable. I've never encountered them before. They feel totally out of control to me. And then that coupled with, I remember taking my freshman high school yearbook picture and getting the picture back and they gave you the option. You can either say, yes, put this picture in the yearbook or if you want to retake, do a retake. And I remember looking at it and thinking, my cheeks are fuller than I remember. Like they look chubbier and I'm not exercising all the time and I'm still eating 19 fish sticks every night, right? Like still eating all this food, like I'm working out all the time, right? And I'm not. So I did two things. I started watching what I ate. So this was the 90s. So for me, it was like, I'm not going to eat much fat was yeah. the decision I made. Yeah. So I'm just going to kind of slowly reduce the amount of fat that I eat. And I'm going to pull my sister around and I'm going to go run around this track at this middle school. Mm. Right. We're going to run around a track at the middle school and I'm going to eat a little bit less fat. And I did that for about a month. I retook the photo and I was like, oh, I like that better. Right. Like I had a slimmer face that I was used to seeing when I was a gymnast. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, great, I'll just kind of continue down this road and see where it goes. And then an interesting thing happened, which was like, before I knew it, it became this little competition with myself of like, ooh, okay, I had a bagel with cream cheese yesterday. I'm just going to do half cream cheese today. And then the next day, no cream cheese. And then from light yogurt to non-fat yogurt. And from putting cheese on my spaghetti at night to nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And it just became like this daily little thing where every day where I reduced it a little bit, I kind of felt like I was winning. Mm. Mm. And people started to notice Mm. and comment, right? And that was attention. People were noticing... That I was losing weight. Yeah. 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 In a positive way. I see. Right? Yeah. So it's like, oh, you look so cute, right? Or, oh, you know, I would choose different clothes to wear. Mm. Like, oh, that looks great on you. Like, yeah, interesting. Yeah. 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 So you're so and and really you're reinforced by just eating less. That's right. And eating less and yeah. eating less. Yeah. 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 And then eventually there's a weird little switch that happens. And I've had a hard time like coming up with an analogy for it. And it's like the folks who have dealt with this kind of know. Um, but it's really hard to understand if you've never been in it, which is like, A, you stop seeing that you're thin. So instead, you start seeing like little flaws everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I would body check myself all the time. Mm. Like walk past any single building where you can see your reflection and I'm glancing in it and I'm finding little flaws, right? Mm -hmm. It became like a little bit of an obsession. I would spend like hours in front of my mirror at night just Mm. like picking myself apart, right? And so that, that happens. And then like before you know it, if you have anything more than what you had had the day before, at least in my situation, it was like the guilt was Mm -hmm. brutal. Mm -hmm. Like I literally, I remember, I remember nights being like laying in my bed and if I had had like uh, a handful of Tostitos corn chips, I was like, I literally wanted to like rip my stomach open. Like that was how just like visceral and terrible it felt. Mm. Right. So, um, and it's hard to understand like when it becomes that unless like, 
oh, I just want to like look better in this high school picture. So it sounds like it happened in the span of three months. Really fast. Yeah. Yeah. It was like four months. Wow. Wow. Four months. Wow. To, and I don't even I don't know what I was before I kind of like started restricting what I was eating, but it was probably twenty pounds. And when you're ninety five pounds, like that's kind of a lot. Yeah. 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 Wow. So yeah, it happened pretty fast. Yeah. Which I think is another reason why it was like it like caught people off guard, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Wait, okay. So from the time this happened to the time you're in the hospital was four months? Yeah. Holy shit. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Really fast. Okay, really and fast. so then you went to the hospital for a month and then yeah. everything's fine, yeah? Right, like, I remember the <laughs> the pediatrician being like, you know, on average, it takes you about twice as long to recover as it does to get sick. Mm. So my mom's like, oh my God, that means it's gonna take eight months to, like, ugh, this is gonna be terrible, right? And it's like, that wasn't even close. <laughs> like 10 years later, right? Yeah. Like, wow. it took a long time. Wow. To get yeah. physically healthy took less time, but to get to a place where I actually had any kind of a redeemable relationship with food, years. Right. Yeah. So what happened kind of after that, like this yeah. sort of next nine year struggle? Yeah. Well, so the rest of high school, that was four years. My mom would probably describe as grueling mm -hmm. because it was this mixture of like periods of being healthy followed by periods of relapse, okay. which is pretty normal. But, um, but it's brutal as a parent. Mm. And, um, and then it, you know, like those years to me are characterized by a lot of deception on my part. Mm. We had this weight, so here's the picture. We had this weight that I had to stay over or else my mom would take me to the doctor and I knew what that meant, right? Yeah. And so that weight was 95 pounds. I got it down, I bargained for 90. So 90 became like, that was the weight. Uh -huh. and, um, and so then what I would do is like, go back into all my old habits, my old, my old like restrictive habits, and we would weigh in like once a week. And so what I would do before the weigh in, like I remember waking up early and going into the bathroom and just chugging a ton of water. And then I had this like, I had this piggy bank full of change. And so mm -hmm. I'd fill a change purse, literally fill a change purse, and tape it, it to my leg, put it under my pajamas, and like walk slowly up the stairs so it wouldn't jingle. Wow. And I would like make the weight. And I'd yeah. be like, wow, I'm doing so great. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right? So uh, yeah, that's kind of how those years went. Like I remember even my, um, like when you're starving yourself, like you get really angry. <laughs> like you're kind of a bad person. Mm -hmm. Like you're moody, you're just like yeah. mean to people. Like yeah. I remember like saying really mean shit to my sisters, right? I was just starving. <laughs> um, but I knew that my mom knew that I would, I would be mean when I was hungry. And so then I would do this thing where I was like, I have to pretend like oh, yeah. I feel really great. Yeah. So she wouldn't know. Yeah. Was, like, it's so, messed up. But how, why didn't you end up in the hospital again if you were falling back into the old habits? I never really got like bad enough that we decided to take that step, right? right. Like I dropped down into the 80s, whatnot, I'm sure. But like... I don't think either of us wanted to go that route again. Nor was it really like, it was never as bad as it was the first time. Mm. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, there wasn't like the fear. I don't think there was the same fear. Yeah. And like there were moments is the thing. Like there would be moments of, you know, weeks or months at the time where it was like, I was eating well. I was generally like genuinely feeling good. Mm -hmm. Like my mood was good. Um, and things were okay. And then it would just kind of backslide. Do you know, I mean, it was a long time ago, but can you think of what were the things that would cause you to backslide? No, I think what it is is like, I think the best way to describe it is like an addiction, mm -hmm. where it's like I became addicted to hunger. Like hunger to me had this really positive correlation of like, ooh, I'm doing good. It's interesting because this I can actually see in clients, mm -hmm. not necessarily always to the same degree, but there's the sense of like, if I'm hungry, I'm winning, right? Yeah. Like if mm -hmm. I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm doing it right. And so that was sort of the addiction that I had. And um, the thing about food is that it's not like smoking or alcohol where you can just abstain from it. Like you have to make multiple decisions around food all the time. So it's like imagine you're an alcoholic and you are put into a bar three times a day, but you just don't drink. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of what it was like, right? Okay, eat these three meals and just be normal, yeah. right? When I'm actually addicted to hunger. <laughs> It's like mm -hmm. I'm gonna find ways to like cut the edges every now and then. Yeah. 
-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of how it went. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those things that if you're an outsider, it's not like you're in your body. Like, I know how you feel. That's right. I know that you did not eat enough. Whereas alcohol, it's like, I can see you drink the thing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Made it super frustrating for my family. Yeah. Right? Like, can you imagine just like watching your daughter or your sister just like actively, you know, try to starve yourself basically. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was just like up and down like this over 10 years? It was like that through um, through high school. And yeah. then a really cool thing happened, which was I made a shit decision. So I had the option after high school to choose between one of two jobs. I was gonna go either work at this dance camp that I had been a participant of for years, or I was going to work for a trail crew. Like mm-hmm. I had, like my dad and I had done a little bit of hiking together, but like I'd never really spent that much time in the woods. But for some reason, I got it in my head that like, yeah, I want to do a trail maintenance crew. That'll be great uh, for a summer. And in my mind, I was like, it's going to be great because I'm going to be outside. I'm going to be active all the time. You know, I was a compulsive exerciser at the Mm -hmm. time too, right? So I'm always trying to run. I'm always like, even just sitting down, I'm like doing crunches, right? Mm -hmm. Like that was my life. Like this will be perfect. I'll be exercising all the time. Like I'll lose all this weight again. It's going to be amazing. And so I chose that direction from a very twisted vantage point. But when I got there, a really cool thing happened, which was like, I was moving in such a way and required to move in such a way that like I had to eat or else I wasn't gonna contribute to this crew. Like Mm. that became clear really early on. Like when I was a dancer before that, I could not eat and fudge it, Mm. right? And in fact, like, being slim was valued in the dance world. So it was kind of like, great, I'm actually doing a good thing. Yeah. But when it came to building trail, where you're like digging away at the side yeah. of a hill with the Pulaski, it's like, if you're not eating, that is not going to end well. Yeah. yeah. yeah and so, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so I started eating more to fuel that work. Mm. And um, then you, I, yeah. How did you feel about that? I mean, like, you're, you're eating to sort of fuel this work. You're like, I, I like being hungry. Yeah. But like, how did you, I don't. It was like, what happened was I had never really done something that I just like really liked that much, to be mm. honest. Right. Like I liked dance a lot, but there was something about being outside and I was with a crew of 10 people and I had this incredible crew leader. And um, I mean, incredible. Like we would lay in our tents at night and she would read to us from The Alchemist. Like that was the memory I have of like this whole experience. It was just like kind of transcendent in a weird way. And, um, and so I actually didn't have any qualms about it. And plus I was around all these other people and we had very little choice. So it was like, we packed one lunch and it was the same lunch that everybody had. It was like a bologna and cheese sandwich. Mm-hmm. Then we packed all these like raisins and peanuts. And then at night we would make this giant pot of food that everyone would just eat from. Mm-hmm. And in fact, if the pot didn't go, if there was food left in it, we would do like death by spoonful. We would pass the pot around until <laughs> the, all the food <laughs> was gone. Because wow. we're in the back country, right? That's yeah. like... So it's like, like, all right. It's like uh, real behavior therapy. For what <laughs> it was 100%. Yeah. <laughs> it was like jumping in the deep end, right? Yeah. So here I'm in a position where I have no choice. I have to eat a lot of food. Yeah. And I'm starting to discover that like, I actually am driven to do well at a thing that doesn't have to do with being thin. Yeah. yeah. And that was like my yeah. first experience feeling like I had a purpose. It kind of feels like being thin was just a thing that you were driven to do and yeah. you just didn't have another thing that you were driven to do. That's exactly right. Or like wanting to contribute to a, a bigger purpose, to a team. Totally. Like just far outweighed you personally like having that addiction. Yeah. 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 That's really interesting because that actually is a similar experience to what a lot of people have here. It's yeah. like they come in, they, you know, they want to lose some weight or whatever, but then they're like, I, I want to get stronger. Yeah. You know, I want to be more athletic and they're sort of driven to do that. Mm-hmm. And as a result, they end up, you know, achieving whatever the original goal is, yeah. even though they don't care about it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally right. Like the analogy that I like to use is, um, and I see this for clients here, especially clients who have histories of disordered eating is like, For so long, I think during my recovery when I was in high school, a lot of it was based around not doing certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. So for example, like my mom would cover all of the nutrition labels on foods with duct tape, right? So I wouldn't look at them because it was like a numbers game always, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, or certain things would get hidden and locked, right? And, uh, and so it was all about like the behaviors that you didn't want to do, and um, which is okay. But what happened around tree work is like, so here's the analogy. You're growing a garden. Yeah. And you've got a lot of weeds in your garden. And one of the things that you could do to get rid of the weeds is... Pull the weeds. Pull the weeds. Yeah. Like, that would be probably the first thing you would do, which is great. But the downside about that is you have to keep pulling them, right? Whereas if you plant something else and you allow something else to grow and provide shade, then the weeds will stop growing up. So it's this idea of, like, I had just been pulling the weeds and pulling the weeds and pulling the weeds. And finally, there had been a seed planted and things were starting to grow that shaded out some of the weeds. It was like my thoughts were just less occupied with eating disorder behaviors than they were with identifying a plant, right? Or planting a tree or yeah. whatever I it was. I learned so much about gardening in that too because yeah. I didn't know about any of that. Yeah, that yeah. Is, <laughs> but that really, was a great... That um, is a solid lesson. analogy. Yeah. That's like, that makes so much sense. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually... Like, I, I think about this often. It's like, for example, a lot of times people want to get in better shape, yeah. one of the best things they can do is stop drinking alcohol. Yeah. But if I tell yeah. you to stop drinking alcohol, then all you're thinking about is... Not alcohol. Yeah, not <laughs> alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Versus like, hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to do a running club every Sunday, yeah. <laughs> right? Sunday morning, early in the morning, yeah. and you got to be ready and, you know, ready to go. So That's maybe right. it's not about stop drinking alcohol. It's like, maybe I'll cut it off at six... Yeah. So that I can go do the running club. Right. And so you have something else, some reason to do it versus yeah. like some reason not to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe some people have had luck with like cutting habits out, but I know I haven't. Yeah. Me it's neither. only worked <laughs> for me to like insert things that I want more. Yeah. No. Yeah. So going for what you want versus That's what right. you don't want. Yeah. yeah. Love that. So, okay. So you started doing this like trail crew yep. and you started eating more Yep. and then it was solved. Yeah, like that was, that I would say was the first piece. Oh, okay. I'd say there were like three pieces that had to come together to like enter 100% recovery. And that was the first one. And if I were to define the first one, it would be find a purpose. Mm -hmm. Or like find something that actually means something to you. Hopefully, maybe more than that behavior or more than that desire to be thin. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that for me was like, okay, I found a thing that I actually care more about. Great. Yeah. Um, but I would say, like, for me, full recovery didn't happen after that. Like, mm. I ended up going to school for biology and for ecology because I'd been inspired by this job. And so I knew outdoor work was for me. Great. So I'm going to study outdoor things. And um, so I kind of took that and I ran with it. But what happened was I still didn't know anything about really nourishing my body. Mm -hmm. And in recovery, what I had been taught was to eat your fear foods. So I had a huge fear of anything with fat in it. Pizza, donuts, french fries, like anything that had a lot of fat was just like on the no list. Mm. And so in recovery, it was like, okay, eat more items from that no list. It was like exposure therapy, mm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Which is great in that you don't fear eating those foods as much. But a lot of those foods were foods that were like hyper palatable. And after half a decade of starving yourself, like there's an interesting thing that happens around those foods. Because when you go to eat them, it's really hard to stop. Mm. And so in college, I entered this era of like binging, where I would just like eat the foods and not be able to stop, right? And then I would purge, I would, you know, throw up or take laxatives or go run a million miles, right? Mm. But that became the new pattern, I see. which... Right. Um, is an insidious one because you can actually appear to be a healthy weight when you're doing these behaviors, yeah. right? Like, so it doesn't catch anybody's eye because you're not dramatically underweight. And yet, like, the feeling is awful. Like, it's terrible, like, to be puking all the time or constantly eating beyond the point of fullness. It's just, like, not fun. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of where things treaded until... Again, in like a twisted way, I would try all these different diets. And one of the ones that I tried was paleo. Mm. So this was after college now. Wait, and wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Okay, why were you trying all these different diets? Um, because I was still like, I was still searching for thinness. Mm. That was still like an objective that I had. Mm. Um, and 
And I, I just remember the feeling of like, I had felt, <laughs> this is going to sound weird, but like, I thought of myself as a failed anorexic when I was in college, wow. right? Like, I just don't have that willpower anymore. Like, that's my fault, wow. right? And so it was constantly like, let me test myself. Let me see if I have the willpower to do this diet where I'm eating nothing but cabbage soup for five days, right? And just like drinking a bunch of broth or whatever, which would work. And then I would eat something else, like a cookie, and then not be able to stop. And so it was just like that, just like yo-yo back and forth like that for years. Yeah, right. Yeah. How long, how, you say years, how long? That was all through college and probably the first few years after college. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Did right. you find yourself chasing like a number, a look, like or just, I mean, yeah, would you have ever? all of ever... that, like all of that, yeah. So in retrospect, you never would have gotten there. I mean, would it always have been more? No, that's the irony of the whole thing. Yeah. It's like, there's no end game yeah. to it, right? It's just like, you're chasing this thing that doesn't really ever yeah. exist. But that's kind of part of the disease. Mm -hmm. And it was weird because, like, nobody in my family would ever describe me as vain. Like, there was a period of time in high school where I was like, I never, like, I didn't shave my legs. I was very hippie, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't give a fuck about how I look. I've never worn makeup. Like, so it was very, like, confusing, even to me, living it. I'm like, why do I even care about this thing? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care how anybody else looks. Like, and I will tell them that, right? But, like, for some reason, it was actually less about looking a certain way and more about, like, here's a thing that I can control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was like a game you were winning. Totally. Yeah, yeah. definitely a game. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. like, and it just becomes, like, the way, the way that you deal with everything. Yeah. Right, like, oh, I'm excited about this thing that happened. Let me go eat food. Or I'm really bummed about this thing that happened. Let me starve myself. Yeah. Like, it's a really useful, was like a very useful tool that way. That's how I would use it. Okay, so the, so the, the second part was you found a diet in the search for diets. That's right. Because it's still there. Yeah, so that's you, right. You found this diet, and how did that impact you? So, okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> So like a typical day in the life for me eating food, this is college and afterwards, would be like, I'm going to have cereal for breakfast, like Rice Krispies. Let me choose something like mad low calorie, right? And then come lunch, maybe I'll have a plain bagel, nothing mm -hmm. on it. And then dinner, if it's a good day, I'll have white rice, some frozen veggies, and an egg with some soy sauce, and a Coors Light. I was cheap. Mm -hmm. um, that was dinner, right? Oh. If I had a bad night, I would binge. Right? Yeah. And eat all the food because I've basically been starving all day. Mm -hmm. And um, and so when I tried paleo, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Like, I can't really have all these breads. Like, I should, yeah. shoot, I can't even have this cereal. Like, yeah. I guess I got to find something else to have. And so I started eating eggs. I remember getting, like, chicken sausage. I remember in my little apartment in Baltimore, like, making for the first time this, like, butternut squash soup. I'm like, oh. okay, whatever. It's got, like, squash. There's cream in it. There was, like, bacon in it. I'm like, fine. We're trying this. And, um, but what ended up happening was like, I felt great. <laughs> like I felt really good. And, uh, you mean eating <laughs> enough food Yo, yeah, <laughs> and protein might actually, yeah. Make you feel yeah. Good. yeah. And it like, it really hit me at that point. Cause whenever, like I really started looking for answers after that, because I was like, this is really amazing. I used to be craving all of these different foods. And I did not think that there was a life where I would not crave Pop tarts, right? Mm. Or would not crave donuts or like these super energy dense, like calorie yeah. dense sweet things. And then I started eating that way and I'm like, weird, I'm not craving this stuff anymore. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. That's... So I started going down the rabbit hole because I was like, really, like in recovery, it was like none of that stuff was taught. Yeah. Like I never, I worked with a dietitian for four years and I never learned how to like nourish myself. That's wow. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's really sad. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me, I don't know if things are different now. I'm optimistic. Yeah. I've also met a lot of women who dealt with eating disorders around the same time I did, and their treatment looked a lot like looked a lot similar. Yeah. Right? So it's like we all kind of got the same talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and there's not as much access to, or there wasn't as much access to information as well, because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, the internet's kind of coming around around that time. Right. There's not like, oh, let me get this information and listen to a podcast yeah. or go to, on TikTok. It was, I have to go to a library and yeah. check out a book and whatever's there. Totally. Yeah. yeah, and like, and it occurred to me too that like, also, 
you know, the dietitian is also working with what I'm not preparing into my food, right? My mom is. Yeah. And so like the dietitian is also working with what, what can she prepare and what is she yeah. comfortable doing? And we were yeah. like, we were the kind of family that we ate cereal for breakfast and we ate yeah. like maybe a sandwich and chips for lunch yeah. and we would yeah. have Campbell's soup and hot dogs. Like there really wasn't, and like for no, no one's fault. That's just what, yeah, yeah. what we grew up doing. And, um, and I think there was, so I, I think there may have been more education on that front or like more work on that front had like we as a family been, you know, like eating this way, but we weren't. Yeah. I mean, neither was my family. Neither yeah. Was my family. Right. Like who yeah, was? Nobody, nobody yeah. Was just described my, nobody, yeah. yeah. Growing up. Yeah. Diet. Exactly. Just, yeah. You just get a bunch. Of, I had a, my dad would pack me bread and potato chips and I'd make a potato chip sandwich. Yeah. For lunch delicious. Every day. <laughs> or like roll it into a ball. Yeah. of yeah. bread. Yeah. Just like tons and tons of, you know, low nutrient carbohydrates. That's right. Basically. That's pretty much what it was. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. like, when I think about it then from that standpoint, it's like the way we coach people here is like, there's no way that dietitian would have told my mom who's got three kids is basically like handling them on her own and is stressed out of her mind because, you know, I've got this thing going on. My other sister had other stuff going on, mm-hmm. right? It's like, there's no way that dietitian's going to be like, so you need to prepare, yeah. you know, yeah. fruits and veggies. And all yeah. Like, there's just no way, right? It's like, I can, yeah. I'm extremely like empathetic to all of that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember it would be like, oh, we're so busy. We're just going to McDonald's yeah, tonight. That's, that's right. That's what we're doing. We right. And we yeah. the, we'd have all the cereals. Oh, we're yeah. out of kicks, mom. Oh, great. You know, yeah. the, you know, whatever. Yeah. That was, that was how it was. Yeah. 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 And I see it over and over again here. It's like, you know, people might have not as severe disordered habits as I had, but there's very frequently this cycle of like, I'm not going to eat that much during the day. And then sometimes if it's a good day, I will also not that eat that much at dinner, right? Mm. And then inevitably what happens is then you binge. You end up eating a lot more, a lot of shitty food at dinner. And then you do the compensation thing where it's like, great, I'm going to starve myself the rest of the day. Yeah. And as soon as people start actually nourishing their bodies with whole foods and getting enough fruits and vegetables and colors and healthy carbs and healthy fats during the day, it's like people have the same reaction I did, which is, oh, weird. I don't crave wheat thins anymore like yeah. huh yeah i actually feel good i feel good yeah okay so that so you you kind of found your way there yeah you said there was three things yeah what was the third one okay so the third one what was interesting about all that is that i started eating better i didn't have as many cravings and yet still some nights i would feel compelled to binge on all the things right yeah. and prior to that point binges had this very physiological aspect to it where it was like as soon as I bit into a cookie or a pop tart it was like I couldn't stop eating it Mm. like physiologically even if I was full it was like that desire was still there Mm. but what happened after I started actually eating better foods for my body is I would be inclined to binge but that same physiological driver wasn't there like I could bite into the pop tart and be like I'm indifferent about this thing and I would continue to eat it regardless and so what I learned from that, A, I, I lived in that land for another four or five years, mm. thinking that once a week, I'm just going to eat these kind of like, you know, hyper palatable fear foods or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And that's just like, that's going to be what recovery looks like for me. It's way better than it's ever been. Like, this is probably just where I'll land. But what I ended up learning from that was like, okay, there's actually, because it's not a physiological driver, there's something else. There's another reason why I want to eat this thing. And it had to do with like, I had zero skill processing or sitting with emotions. Hmm. So for me, it became like this thing that was like a numbing. It was less like of a physiological need and more like I'm feeling a thing. I don't know what to do with it. Let me numb myself to it by like engaging in this very like sensation oriented behavior, right? Like the same reason some people turn to drugs or turn to alcohol to just numb whatever they're going through. You just kept eating. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big leap. Yo, okay. huge. So yeah. how did... Okay. <laughs> so you, you're eating all this food and you're sitting there like putting food in your mouth and you're like, what are you writing in your journal? Like, why do I keep eating this food? Like, why would... How would you make this connection? I think like it took me... There's a reason it took me like a lot of years yeah. to figure it out. And that's because like I wasn't thinking that stuff. Yeah. Until... It's like... This is the point in my recovery where, like, I can't pinpoint a moment. Mm. The only thing I can pinpoint is, like, I think there were a lot of things that happened, whether it was relationships with different people, um, 
starting to become more confident. So in 2012, I started CrossFit and that was actually a big turning point for me because I started um, just feeling more confident, caring Mm -hmm. more about weight than I cared about like my weight, Mm -hmm. like lifting weights than my own weight. Um, And I think there was this element of like, I actually feel like I have some control now that doesn't involve food. Mm. And so it was like, okay, if I, now I know all these other things, like I used to be mad anxious, but like through different relationships with people, through living on my own, it was like, okay, you kind of start to face these little fears and you realize I'm actually not that bad at talking to people or I actually can change what I'm physically capable of by going to the gym and doing this thing, right? So it's kind of like I'm looking at this pattern that I have and suddenly I'm like, huh, I just took it for granted that this is like as good as it's going to get. But maybe I actually have some power to change it. Okay. There's still so much. Totally. So there's, there's still, still such a big leap. Like, sorry, Wendy. Oh, no, that's <laughs> Wendy. Oh, sorry. Wendy's out on this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy's like, that's it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, but like, okay, so there's two things that happen here, right? Yeah. One is that you, that you, you know, started to see a pattern. Yeah. But you're like, why would you even like think to look for a pattern? Yeah. Like, why? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what would make you even ask the question? Like, is this as good as it's gonna get? Yeah. Is that just innate, or did something happen that? Mm, I think like it still didn't feel good. Mm. Right? Like, I'm still eating a shit ton of Pop-Tarts and then puking them up. Mm. And I'm just having this vision of, like, <laughs> of, like, this is going to be the time. Like, okay, you don't need to know all the graphics, but, like, when you make yourself vomit, sometimes what happens is, like, shit gets stuck in your throat. Mm. Right? And you, like, choke on shit. Mm-hmm. And you're like, is this the way it's going to be? Like, is somebody going to walk into this apartment and I'm just going to be, like, like, I don't, mm. So, like, even though it wasn't a frequent occurrence, every time it would happen, I'm like... I don't think this is great. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then a week would go by and I would be all right. And then I would make that decision of like, ah, eh, it's worth a trade off. Yeah. I'm gonna eat all the ice cream. I mean, I can imagine it. Cause I've you know, never been there, but I have drank enough to where I'm vomiting so much in the same way that I'm like, is this what life is? I'm going to wake up every morning and I'm going to be literally on the bathroom floor, yeah. like with my head on the toilet and I don't even care. Like, who was here before me and yeah. it's like a low and you just got to start yeah, questioning yeah. like is yeah. this what I want my life to be like right. but then yeah the feeling goes away and then the next week you're you know mm-hmm. yeah I'll have mm-hmm. that 10th whiskey right. and coke mm-hmm. and you're living it again so yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. So it's just like that all right cool and to your point too like yeah and to your point too like you you know at that point I had started filling my life with things that I cared about yeah and things to show up for and so there was this element of like all right, well, on Sunday morning, I'm going to brunch with my friends. I'm going to feel like absolute shit Yeah. if I, you know, like, um, so there was that element of it too. Yeah. Okay. But then what is the part where you kept doing like things that were scary to you? Like what caused that? I think like I got rewarded, I think is the thing, right? Like doing the trail crew was a big one for me, which is like, I have no idea how to do this thing. Like this is terrifying. I'm doing all new things. But then you're like, at the end of every day, you're like, I am the shit. Like, mm-hmm. I just built three miles of trail today. And on my way back to camp, I walked over every single one of them, right? Like, that's really freaking sick. And so it was like, okay, I'm doing this scary thing, but I'm realizing that the reward is so big that, like, I'm just going to choose the next scary thing. Mm. And it. then the reward continued to be big, yeah. right? And finally, I realized, I was like, okay, actually, my formula for happiness is like, do shit that scares you. And then happiness becomes an echo of that thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that was sort of the. Right. Okay. So remind me again, what, what was, what was point three? <laughs> so, so for me, it was like, okay, so number one, there was this element of like having to find meaning, having to find purpose. Yep. And, I, and I didn't know any of this stuff at this time. Like now I've had years to like reflect mm-hmm. and look back on it. And I'm like, that's the formula, yeah. right? For me. Yeah. It was find meaning, find purpose. Then it was like find a healthful way of eating. Yeah. It was actually nourishing your body. And then number three was like find a way to manage emotions. Mm. Right? Yeah. It was yeah. like the final piece of it. Yeah. And I think like a big one for me around this, like as I started like researching um, this question of like, huh, I wonder if there are other people out there like me who do this thing. 
right? And then that was probably the only point in time or like the very first point in time where I actually started like identifying as someone in recovery mm. and like someone who was part of this bigger community of people who were also struggling with the same things that I was struggling with, mm. right? You're like half in, half out. And for me, it was like, well, I wasn't in recovered camp. I wasn't like a normal person, but I also wasn't like a hospital person. Mm -hmm. So I was in this weird limbo and it didn't feel good. Yeah. But the more I started like researching and learning, it was like, oh no, like there's a whole community of people. I read, um, there's a book called Eating by the Light of the Moon. And it's like one of the like, kind of foundational eating disorder, bulimia recovery books. And I read that and I was like, this... This is like speaking exactly to where I'm at right now. Yeah. I'm not a failed anorexic and I'm not like this person who can't eat normal. I'm just in recovery. Mm. Okay. And people who are in recovery do these kinds of things. They journal, mm. right? They think about how their body feels and they think about the emotions that they have before they sit down to a meal, right? Mm. Like there were all these little practices that... I felt empowered to do because I didn't feel alone. Mm. And I learned that there were other people around who were like doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So is, is there any moment where you're just like, huh, that's behind me now. That's not who I am anymore. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know. You could ask a million people, but I don't, I would. <sighs> no, <laughs> no, there's like, there's not one clear moment. Mm. Like, but it just is this gradual progression of things where I can say, I remember at one point living in New Haven, probably 2015, 2016. And I remember thinking back and being like, wow, I'm trying to remember the last time I binged and mm. threw up. And I'm mm. like, I actually like really have to work to remember when that was. Mm. It's like, it's probably been a month, maybe a month and a half. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. Okay. And then it was like, oh, it's been six months. Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah. I guess maybe I'm like recovered. Yeah. 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 Do you do you feel like if you knowing what you know now went back to your, you know, 16-year-old self, do you think it would take you 10 years? No. I don't think so. I mean, knowing what I know now, no way. And I mean like that's that's part of the reason why I do this. Mm. Yeah. Honestly, like I think about how long it took me to get here and I had a um, the year I decided to quit doing tree work and go into coaching full time, nutrition coaching, was the year that my cousin, who also dealt with an eating disorder, ended up losing his life. And it was like, okay, like, it was crazy. It was like, he lost his life his sophomore year in college, which was my, the worst year of my life. Wow. And so it was like, oh, fuck, like, yeah. I know exactly what that was like. I don't know everything he was going through, right? But it was that moment where I was like, man, like, I'm glad I had somebody to, like, kind of help walk me through that, right? Like, maybe there's something that I can actually do about that. You yeah. Know? So, yeah, I mean, like, a big part of the reason why I do this now is because, like, I don't think it should have to take 12, 15 years to get a point of full recovery. Yeah. I'm not saying it's going to happen fast. Yeah. Like, I'm, you know, I think for a lot of people who have anywhere close to a history that I have with food, like, is it reasonable for it to expect it to take like a year? Definitely. Two years, three years, probably. Yeah. Right? To be at a place of like 100% full recovery. Yeah. Like in my house, if you're to look at it right now and walk around the kitchen, it's like, I've got fruits, I've got vegetables, I've got protein, I've got a box of Lucky Charms sitting on my counter right now and like a big bag of jelly beans, right? And it's like, they can just sit there for a week and I can enjoy them sometimes when I want it, but it's not like... I have to all the time. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about listening to your story is some of the stuff that you described now, you know, like, I don't know about you. I haven't had a history of like eating disorders, right. especially in a sort of clinical sense, but like some of the things that you described sound a lot like what it was like to grow up mm -hmm. in, you know, in my house. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, we're eating tons of carbohydrates, eating mm -hmm. a ton of food and like, you know, just like hyper palatable food. And, yeah. and sometimes you're like, well, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I just, I never had the desire to get thin, but. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, right. that's the thing. It's just like you, you, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, kind of finding the, the, the piece where 
you know, you find food that actually nourishes you and you find that you're not eating as much of that right. crappy food. And like, I haven't done a ton of research in this too, but I'm sure there's some neurochemistry going on there too. Oh yeah. Right? Like, yeah. I think there's a reason why eating those kinds of foods for me was also tied to this like compulsive kind of thinking, this like depression, right? Yeah. It's like, I just wasn't getting things that were actually helping me. Yeah, it was this dopamine cycle, right? Totally. You, you know, it's, it's just like any other addiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, amazing. <laughs> uh, really appreciate you sharing this story. It's actually, it's actually really, inf- for me, I learned a lot about like how you or why you coach people the way mm. you do, why you ask a lot of questions and the, the direction that you ask those mm-hmm. questions. It makes a ton of sense mm. because you, you know, you went to the kind of extreme Mm-hmm. of what a lot of people go through at a low level. That's right. But they never really ask the question. That's yeah. right. We have a, qu- a couple of questions around around this. So when, I mean, I can see how, not, uh, not as severely, uh, but in clients, that they go through these things, whether mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I ate so much yesterday, I'm just not going to eat a lot today. Or, I mean, I, when I was doing Weight Watchers, it was like, mm-hmm. I'm going to earn all these points and, oh, I ran just a little bit further, so I'm going to lie to the Weight Watchers thing. Yeah. But I would never consider that, you know, as I look back, it seems very disordered. But, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're in it, you don't realize it and it's not to that extent. So how often do you find your, like, clients who are part of this, who are doing it, who are actively, like, in some form of, like, binging or, like, you know, withholding in their own, in their own way? yeah. Oh, a lot. Like, I actually, there's, um, there's this great podcast I listen to who's it's hosted by this woman named Ginny Jones, and she counsels parents of eating disorder kids or folks, and, it's, um, and she says it really well. She's like, these habits persist often, like, unnoticed because, like, in a lot of ways, society condones this type of behavior, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. society condones disordering behaviors. And so it's like, yeah, people might be doing these things, but it's like, they think it's the thing that they should be doing, yeah. you know? Um, so, yeah, I just had a conversation with somebody the other day, like, around that, which is, like, here's this cycle. Here's the cycle that we're in. Like, how do you stop the cycle, right? Yeah. It's like, so one of the very first things they teach you when you're in recovery from binging disorder or bulimia is, like, if you have a binge, the very most important thing for you to do the next day is eat your first meal, mm. right? Mm. Like, even if you're not hungry for it, eat it. But don't restrict that meal because then it just sets you up for this whole other. Because in that, I remember going through this and I remember that being like, I am really trusting right now because this feels terrible. Yeah. I feel terrible. My body is not hungry. I'm, I have all this guilt. And now I'm eating fucking breakfast. Like, yeah. fuck all of this. Like, yeah, I yeah. hated it. Right. But like, it mattered. And like, then you set yourself up. We're like, well, actually, the worst thing that happens here is I'm not that hungry for dinner tonight. Cool. So I'm like less inclined to binge and they can have a normal day the next day. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. I don't even remember what my question was. <laughs> <laughs> like how frequently do you see this yeah, pattern? Like yeah. all, all the, the time. time. Yeah. All the time. I would say it's probably like the most frequent pattern I see. Yeah. And I guess short of, I mean, you know, telling your story every single time you see it kind of there in some form, like how do you, is the goal to get the, the client to see that that could be where they're at? Is it to, I mean, how is that? Yeah, so all I, I feel like coaching it, all I can do is let me just share what I'm seeing. This is the pattern that I'm noticing. Do you notice it? Mm. And then like, how do you, what are some ways that you think we could break this? Mm-hmm. Here's my suggestion. This has worked for me. This has worked for a lot of people. Like, let's experiment with it and try it. I know it's going to be hella scary. Yeah. I get it. It's not going to feel good. Like, let's try it. And if after a week or two, we're like, feels terrible, then great. We'll mix it like anything else. So that's like, um, that's, I think, been helpful for a lot of people feeling like, okay. Um, I can do this for 10 days. I can do this for 10 days yeah. and see what happens. What other, what other questions do you have? I don't know. I, I have, I, okay, go ahead. I have one last one. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to kind of wrap it up. Okay. Unless you have any other ones. I'm sure it'll come to me right. like in an hour from now or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can always ask her as, as she sits across the desk from you. <laughs> um, so just the last thing is, you know, if, if you, 
if you're sort of identifying some of this stuff after hearing your story, you know, you're listening to this, you're identifying some of this stuff, like where do you recommend people sort of start or where do you think they should go for help? Yeah, like if they are, yeah, if they're kind of like struggling with disordered eating patterns. Like Even, yeah, whether it's, that way. whether it's, you know, serious or just like a few things here yeah, and like, there. Oh, I yeah. connect with what Katie said in some yeah. way. Right, yeah, so... Um, there's like a bunch of, I mean, I can, there's like a bunch of books um, that I think hit on a lot of these things. Um, but one of the, the reality is like a lot of people are on their phones, mm-hmm. right? So it's like one of the, I think the biggest things that you can do and one of the things that helped me the most was like curating my social media. Like mm-hmm. I used to use, um, they called it thin spell, like thin inspiration. It's like, I would save all these pictures of myself when I was thin. I would like look at other people on social media that were thin and like social media will serve it up to you, right? Mm-hmm. Like you don't have to ask very hard to get all of that shit. Yeah. Um, and so like curating that was like, let me just unfollow or get rid of anyone who's showing me something that doesn't feel good or anyone who's giving me diet advice that is like rooted in you should do mm-hmm. this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that doesn't have like a nuanced, it depends kind of feel to it. Like you're out, you're out. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's other people who like, even if you just sort of search within like the recovery community, there is a world of people out there who are posting amazing things yeah. that you might relate to and that have advice that you could offer and who are posting images of different bodies and different body sizes. Yeah. And it's like, you don't think that stuff makes a difference, but like you look at it enough and that just becomes normalized to yeah. you. Yeah, one of those people is uh, is sitting right here. Yeah. <laughs> so if people want to know more, how do they get in contact with you? Uh, yeah, you can DM me. Katie Beecham on Instagram is good. And um, that's probably the best way. Yeah, awesome. Katie, appreciate you for doing this. This is Thanks. really, really great. Solid. Yeah, really great. Thanks, y'all. We'll see y'all. Next time. Next time. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, we've got plenty of others. Go check out this one over here.